Hi, I'm Andrew Millen, and you're all very welcome back to the Celtic Soul Podcast. Podcast available across all platforms and on Celtic Fanzine TV. The Celtic Soul Podcast and Celtic Fanzine TV are brought to you by more than 90 minutes Celtic Fanzine, which first went on sale at Celtic Park 21 long years ago. Issue 122 is now available to buy in both print and digital format by visiting CelticFanzine.com. And if you're listening on Celtic Fanzine TV, please hit that subscribe button so you'll never miss an episode. This episode of the Celtic Soul Podcast is sponsored by the Rue Glen Hotel on the Kilkenny Waterford border, and we thank John Mooney for his continued support. If you're a Celtic minded business or a Celtic supporters club and you would like to sponsor an episode of the podcast, the fanzine or the website, please email info at CelticFanzine.com. You can also message us on social media or leave a message on CelticFanzine.com. We would like to send our best wishes to Frank McGarvey, who has been diagnosed with cancer recently. Frank was a regular guest at Celtic AM and always gave us plenty of laughs as he retold tales from his time with Celtic and his relationship with the Celtic fans. So, Frank, a big battle on your hands and um, we're all rooting for you. Joining me today on the show for a chat is former Celtic striker, tone media pundit, John Harton. John was part of that wonderful era under Martin O'Neill, sharing goal-scoring duties with the great Henrik Larsson and Chris Sutton. John has beaten both cancer and his gambling addiction, and we welcome him very much back to the show. John Harton, you're very welcome back to the Selling Soul podcast. It's been a while since we've had you on the show. How are you doing? Good. I'm very good, Andrew. Um, everything's fine. Uh, the kids are off school. Well, two of them are, so uh, we're busy with the children. And uh, no, everything's fine, mate. I'm healthy. I'm good. I'm looking forward to going to the World Cup at the um, just the back end of November there. So with ITV, I'm really looking forward to that one. So... Uh, I'm in a good place, mate. Looking at watching Celtic, leaving it till last minute, but uh, that's better than uh, that's better than anything else. Yeah, John, on on the goal uh, on on Saturday, um, that late goal, like the excitement in the stadium and also the excitement in you know in pubs and clubs around the world when when a late goal goes in. Can you remember uh, scoring a late one for Celtic? <laughs> well, once or twice. Um, yeah, I can. And, and you know what? I, I like Angie's interview again when he said, uh, the manager said, well, there's more than one way to, to skin a cat. You know, there's there's more than, uh, there's many ways you can win a game. You can go 3 nil up and you can concede a couple of goals later on and you hang on to wins. You can absolutely um, dominate the game and end up getting beat, or you can score a last-minute goal, um, and that gives such joy to so many people because you've left it. It's like losing something, Andrew. Say, for instance, you lose your phone, you're devastated, and then the joy of actually finding the phone, you know, you're absolutely overjoyed when you actually find it. It was almost worth losing it because you found it and you're just delighted that, you know, you've actually found your phone type of thing. And it's the same as scoring last minute. But Celtic had many chances in the game. I thought St. Johnson um, did very well in the second half, especially in the last 20 minutes. I thought they really pushed Celtic. They got the equaliser. Um, and then I think a lot of us thought, well, that's it. We're going to drop points. But uh, to be fair, uh, to Burnaby got down the left hand side. Uh, McCarthy did well to slip in the ball, and it's a great cross. And Jack Amakis does what top goal scorers do: he's in the right place at the right time to tap the ball in. Uh, so I, I was actually happy that Jack Amakis started the game. Uh, I've been I've been wanting him to start for a couple of games now. I think Kyogo just looks. I love Kyogo, and I've, I've gone on record and said he's world he's world class. Um, but I just felt it was he needed that Jackamakis is chomping at the bit to get to start games, um, and he brings goals. He, he brings that physicality to the side, and uh, he's in there. He's in there where you where you said the forward should be to to finish it off. And uh, delighted, delighted again with the character the players show, great spirit amongst the group. And as I said, mate, there's more than one way to win, and we had to wait till the 90th minute or whatever it was, injury time. Um, Whereas a couple of weeks ago we beat Dundee United nine 0 so the game was over by you know within the first half an hour. But sometimes you know uh, 
the players keep going, missed a few chances, uh, should have been out of sight again, two or three goals, you know, good opportunities. But then, uh, you know, Joe Hart as well, the flex one, great save onto the post. So from winning it, we could have been in the situation where it could have been 2-1 down as well. So, no, we're overjoyed, bounced back very well from St. Mirror and we've won two games, Motherwell and St. Johnson. Um, so back on form in the league, uh, not really, not really getting as many goals as we would like. But as we said, sometimes the goals just don't flow and you just got to go and take your chances. Yeah, John Gio Marcus, he has this knack of uh, scoring one touch goals, which is like his record. I think he's, I think he's, of all the goals he scored for so far, I think he's took a touch on one of the goals. Every one of them has been just bang, first touch. It's remarkable. It's remarkable that, that stat. Uh, and maybe, you know, sometimes I remember myself, big centre forward. If I had too much time, if I took a touch and you, 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 you try and place it or you try and preempt in your mind if the ball comes to you, where you're gonna, where you're gonna place your first touch. And sometimes, uh, you're better off just hitting it first time and, uh, and not having too much time to think about what you're going to do with it. You know, just be clinical, just pick your corner and bang, you know. And, you know, he's, he's, he's showed that he's a fantastic finisher. He can score headers. He's, he's shown his agility. He's got scissor kick sort of attempts. I really like him. Uh, and the, the, we have two good centre forwards. And like everything else, he needs supply. He needs service. And when, when, when the rest of the players are giving him service, He's not letting anybody down. That ball came in at the weekend. I seen his, his run. He started his run at the edge of the six-yard box and he got across his man and he got in a position where it was him eventually that, that tapped in the uh, Burnaby's cross. Um, but that is, an, that is a, you know, that record of one-touch finishing. He's just instinctive. And uh, sometimes that's the best way to do it. Because if you, if you take a touch, there's too much time to think you can end up sometimes missing them opportunities, but no. Um, I like him. Uh, I've liked him from day one. And uh, again, I, I hope he gets a little bit of a run in the side now, like he always had. You know, don't just bring him in for one or two games and give him five or six games and uh, give him the opportunity to get, you know, to get to get on a bit of a run uh, like Kyogo has just had. But listen, that's only my opinion. I don't pick the team. You know, I don't think Ange has done a lot wrong. Uh, he's done fantastically well, so he'll address it. He'll have a look at his options, and uh, I would imagine Jackamakis will stay in for for Leipzig tomorrow night. Yeah, well, just for, just for the um, just for the the listeners, we're recording this on Monday because of the schedule this week. We're sadly playing, sadly playing away, and uh, sadly playing at home in Europe, and then but this show will go out on Friday. So hopefully, Joe, uh, John, by the time it goes out on Friday, that we're uh, celebrating another. Big, big night at Celtic Park. Yeah, well, it's a case of you know, a must win, isn't it? Yeah, it's a must win. Yeah, we, we've got a point on the board from our draw away in Shakhtar Donetsk. Uh, at home, Celtic are a different proposition with the crowd and with the atmosphere and just the way you go out there as a player. You, you, you just feel a lot better um, at home. Um, you feel like that responsibility to go and attack and to go and create chances and <clears throat> I tend to get on the front foot and the whole performances this season have been uh, last season as well have been very very good um, so I, I, I wouldn't rule, rule out the Celtic win although I thought Leipzig um, were the better team uh, last week in Germany I thought that they uh, they had a bit more on the night, they did more to win the game than Celtic did. Celtic were a little bit wasteful again with some opportunities. Um, but I thought Leipzig were, were, were uh, just at a better level on the night. They deserve to win the match. So hopefully Celtic can um, get the three points uh, next, you know, in, in the next game and then they can put themselves in a great opportunity to try and win the, the second last one against Shakhtar. And let's not forget, we can still finish with seven points. Uh, that will definitely put us in third. May well 
put us runners up. We have to wait and see how the other results go. And you're hoping that Real Madrid cleans up and wins the group. Um, so I think seven points would be a, a, a fantastic um, total if we can get there. I don't think it's beyond us because we've got two home games. And look at the way we played against Real Madrid. We should have been two up last time. We were very wasteful. Abada went through one-on-one. McGregor hits the inside of the post. Uh, Maeda has a chance two minutes into the second half. And up until this period, uh, Real Madrid hadn't created a, a, a decent chance of their own. Um, so if, if, if on another night, you know, we, we could have come away with a brilliant result, it wasn't to be. The game is for 90 minutes, as we know. Um, but no, uh, you know, there is a possibility that we might finish with seven points. It's, it's, it's not beyond the realms of um, what Celtic are capable of. You know, they have to bounce back from a poor performance in Leipzig. And I'm sure they will. Uh, we got a few injuries. That's unfortunate. Our captain, Callum McGregor, is out for a while. But it, it gives somebody else an opportunity to come in and, and to show his worth. Yeah, John. Um, hopefully, hopefully, as I said, this goes out on Friday. So hopefully, you know, we, we have those three points in the bag and four points on the board. Media-wise, John, you're, you're busy with the media. But you, you mentioned there uh, you're going away with Wales to the World Cup with ITV. Uh, I know you were... You were hoping to get that gig and you're really looking forward to it. And when do you head off? I head off around the 18th or 19th of uh, November. So just over a month away. I'm looking forward to it. I've got several. I'm doing eight shows, uh, including the three Wales games, where Wales play um, USA on the 21st of November. A really strong USA team. And then and then Wales play Iran on the 25th. And then there's a small matter of England on the 29th of November. So I'll be covering all them games with some real top um, broadcasters like Clive Tilsley and um, one or two others as well, um, the, the, commentary, the commentary boys. And so I'm very much looking forward to that trip. I'm very proud, obviously, of the boys. That's three major tournaments in, in the last... Um, in the last uh, six years that Wales have, have qualified for, having not qualified for a tournament for over 50 years. This is the first World Cup that Wales have been to since 1958, so that's 64 years. So everybody in Wales, all the football fraternity, are uh, delighted with the players. They've done exceptionally well, this group. Robert Page has got them over the line. So very much looking forward to that. And I'm also looking forward to one or two um, other games. I'm also doing Denmark versus Tunisia with Seb Hutchinson. I'm doing Morocco v Croatia with John Champion. Um, Japan, I've got Japan versus Costa Rica, a game that I'll be doing. Japan versus Spain as well, which would be a fantastic uh, game because obviously we've got several Japanese and uh, Japan internationals you know, here with us at Celtic. So very much looking forward to seeing which one of them players, um, Hitachi, Kyogo, uh, Maeda, you know, which ones play in the World Cup for Japan. They're very strong side. Um, so, yeah, it's really exciting, Andrew. I, I can't wait to go. I, I did the Euros with ITV. I did the I did the uh, 2016 Euros in, in France with the BBC, where Wales, of course, got to the semi-final of that, that particular tournament. So, yeah, I'm, I'm passing over it. As I said, now this is a tournament that it's a World Cup in Qatar. I would imagine it'd be a great experience. Um, so, brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Can't wait. Yeah, John, Wales definitely punching above their way, uh, but they also have, uh, you know, a, a superstar in Gareth Bale. So, best of luck to you on that one. Uh, I, w- I wish Ireland were there, but I think we're at the moment a long way off uh Qualification, especially with the, the tough group that was announced for for the uh, for the Euros. But look, we we wait and hope. John, um, another another I mentioned, um, you know, we talk about Celtic there, John. But I just want to. I watched an interview with a former Arsenal player, um, Paul Merson, recently, and and it's it's amazing that Paul was addicted to drink, drugs, and gambling. Now. That Arsenal team as well. Tony Adams is, is you know, is drinking as well. Documented. Um, you were you were a young player there, John. But you know, gambling was your addiction. Um, 
can you just take us back? Did did it, did it start before you know you started making making money as a, as a professional footballer? You know, when when did this you know love of backing start? Well, my gambling, uh, I, I've I've done uh, when you when you start to go to GA Andrew, which is Gamblers Anonymous, which I started going. I I tried. I've tr- I tried to go to GA um, when I was younger. I say younger when I first started playing, and um, I never stuck to it. I, I, I was never really ready to go. Um, I think any addiction that you have, you either have to throw yourself right into the recovery or not bother at all. Because if you're not ready to stop and if you're not ready to make a change and to change your life and change many aspects of your life, then there's not much point in even starting because you're wasting your own time, you're wasting your family's time, your friends' time, the people at the people in the fellowship's time. Um, so I wasn't ready then. With all due respect, I just wasn't ready to stop. Uh, I was very young. Uh, I say young, around about my late teens. <laughs> So in 2011, it, it all came to a head, really. I'd been gambling for 20 years. Um, and uh, my wife, my, my wife, um, Liz basically put it on the line, put, put it to me that she thought so much of me that she couldn't stay with me because of what I was doing to myself. Um, the stress, the... Uh, the gambling, the lies, the deceit, uh, all this stuff. So my wife, Sarah, God bless her. Um, she said to me that she was, she was going, she was leaving. She'd packed the suitcases and she was going back to Scotland. We were living in Wales. We were very happily married, living like a normal family, but I had just this in the destructive gambling problem. Uh, so. That hurt me really bad. That that was my rock bottom, and uh, I realised from then that I need to change my life. Uh, I need to do something about this because uh, I can't lose my wife and my children over this, you know. So I decided to go to GA. It was the fifth of October, two thousand and eleven, and this time, other than the last time, I had many different reasons to uh, to try and stay clean, to try and stay abstinence. From, from gambling. Um, I had my family on the line. I had my relationship with my children on the line. I had my financial situation on the line. And I had just my self-well-being, which was the most important thing, um, on the line. I'd come through cancer. I was only uh, two years out of hospital when my, my, my battle with cancer that I, I luckily successfully won. Um, so I went to GA on the 5th of October, 2011. And uh, two days ago, two or three days ago, the 5th of October, 2022, I celebrated being 11 years clean. And my life has turned around um, dramatically. Um, I now live in a beautiful home. Um, I've got not one penny's worth of debt. Um, Financially, I'm, I'm in probably a better place than I ever was even when I was playing football. Um, my wife has played a huge role in that. She takes care of every single penny that comes into the household. And um, and I'm a better person and I'm a cleaner person and I'm more focused and I'm not struggling with an addiction uh, where lots of people struggle with different types of addictions. Um, I still go to meetings. I, I realise how... how difficult um, addictions are to crack and to break Um, so it takes it takes a lot of um, work it takes a lot of commitment Um, meetings are still very much part of my life and still will be until the day I die Um, and and that's where I am now basically and uh, Listen, we can fill in the nuts and bolts from the 11 years in between, the time it, the time before that, um, when I was uh, 45, you know, 20 years before I was, before I decided to start, uh, before I was in my midst of my gambling, if you like, and while I was gambling, we can fill all them parts in, but 
literally that's where I am today. Um, I'm very proud of myself, you know, I'm very proud of all the people that have been there for me, the ones that have helped me, the ones in GA, that fellowship, become friends now. And uh, there's lots and lots of doors open for me, lots of doors open for me now since, in terms of I've set up a company called the John Hartson Recovery uh, Gambling Workshops, where we go out and we do talks. Um, and I'm very passionate about helping people now with regards to them not going down the same path as I went down. So I feel it's important for me um, to give something back. And I'm passionate about that. Like I was passionate about writing a book about my cancer. Uh, I'm passionate about giving cancer talks because it, that's just the type of person I am really. I want to help people and, you know, I'm no angel. I've made mistakes. Uh, I'd, I'll admit that. But, you know, I'd like to think one thing that I am now is uh, I'm honest. Yeah, John, um, just, you, you know, you talk about doing talks now. You know, what are the signs for, you know, young people to, or maybe, you know, they start off enjoying a punt, uh, you know, going down the pub, back in the, back in the football, back in the horses, and then it's not going to the pub, it's going to the bookie shop, uh, and it just has consumed them. What advice, like, is it just to get into GA? Uh, well, for me, a GA works. Um, it's worked because the one thing you get with GA, you get no nonsense, and you're you're sitting in a group. Um, you become friends with the other members of the group, and um, most of them guys, I would say, all of them guys. I've pulled every single stroke there is to pull in the book in terms of gambling and lying and um, the whole issues that a gambler has. So what happens in these groups is that you're in there for one reason. It doesn't matter who you are, what you do, what job you've got, whether you're a lawyer, a builder, a footballer, a rugby player, a banker. It, it doesn't matter. Taxi driver, um, you're all in there for one thing. And that's to get help with your with your gambling addiction. We're all together. We're all a fellowship. We're family. We're members. Um, so GA is very good. It's worked for me. It doesn't always work for everybody. Some people relapse. Some people relapse after 10, 15, 20 years. And that's why I'm fully aware 11 years without the bet. Um you know, I'm only 30 seconds away from my next bet if I let this horrible, horrible addiction um, start creeping into my life again. So uh, the, the, the signs basically are uh, spending more time uh, in the bookmakers as more than what you spent the week before, um, spending more money, starting to borrow money, um, telling lies, telling complete and utter lies every week, being a compulsive liar, because compulsive addicts are compulsive liars. An alcoholic will tell his wife he hasn't had a drink for three months, but he'll sleep with a bottle of vodka under his pillow. You know, um, we are very, very good liars. Not because we're not nice people, but because we are not very well. We're ill. We're ill with this problem, um, and we'll do everything to, to get a bet on. We'll do everything to get that drugs, that everything to get that drink um, to a stage where you, you, it's desperation in the end, you know. And, and then for me, um, it was that rock bottom stage um, where, you know, that was rock bottom for me when, when I said earlier on about the, the chat I had with my, with my wonderful wife, Sarah, um, but there are many signs, I suppose. There are many signs. One of the signs are, you know, you're happy when you're winning. Um, and, and obviously you, you can be quite moody and downbeat when, when you're losing. Um, so, you know, that that's that's where we are with it all. And um, I work extremely hard now in giving something back um, because gambling as well, Andrew, it's what they call the secret addiction. Uh, you know, if you're an alcoholic or, you know, um, sadly, 
you know, you're an alcoholic or sadly you've got an addiction with drugs or sadly you've got an, uh, uh, an addiction with sex or gaming or, tr- or fitness or eating. There are so many different disorders and, um, and addictions. You know, there's, there's, people tend to think the big ones like drinking drugs and alcohol, you know, gaming. Gaming people are sitting up all night now, gaming, you know, on the computer, playing, playing on their, on their screen, trying to clock games, spending fortunes on getting through to the next levels and fitness. People can't stop training. People can't stop running marathons. It's, that's an addiction. Um, there's, there's so many different ways you can look at addictions. Um, so as I said, you know, um, the gambling, they call it the silent one because if if you're sitting in a room and somebody comes into the room and they've had a they've had a shed full of lager or whatever, they tend to be falling over, boisterous, loud, like we've all got when we've had a few too many drinks. If you if you're taking drugs, uh, I would imagine it's a dead giveaway with people. Um, some people that are taking drugs, you can almost tell straight away. Um, but with the gambling, somebody could have just gone to the bookmakers and, uh, and lost a fortune. And he'd walk into the room and he, you have no idea. You have no idea other than maybe just being a little bit subdued, maybe with himself. But, you know, other than that, um, you know, you can gamble, but there's no real real signs to it, you know, other than the the ones that I mentioned there, uh, you know, in terms of speaking, will they speak out? A lot of them are a bit shamed of, of what they're doing. I was, I was a bit embarrassed. Um, and in the end, I was tired, Andrew. I was really tired um, with the way I was going, um, letting people down, telling lies, um, just being not a nice person to be around, I suppose. Just being false, false in front of my friends, but uh, and then treating the people that loved me, treating the people that supported me wrongly, not in a nice way. Um, so I was tired, and I was sick to death of the way I was, and that was one of the reasons why, you know, I went and I made a decision. That's me. That is me. Uh, I'm going to turn this around, and as I said, it's not easy. It's it's time. It's uh, it's dedication, and, and that's where I am today. And I'm so glad I done it. And you know, um, I'm I'm a recovering gambling addict. That's what I am. Um, I'm in recovery. And John, would I be correct in saying that you know you made good money playing football? Did did it all go to the bookies? <laughs> I'm saying it all went to the bookies, you know. My, I bought my parents a house, uh, bought other people stuff. Um, you know, my, my, both my wives had brand new cars and we, we, you know, we went on fantastic holidays and, you know, um, I had nice, nice clothes and expensive stuff. So I'm saying it all went, but, um, what I should have had and what I ended up with was, you know, was, was nowhere near what I should have retired with in terms of my finances. But as I said earlier on, in the last 11 years, I've probably done about five or 600 shows, six, you know, 50, 40, 50, 60 shows a year uh, between the television and, and, and speaking events and radio shows and just general media. Um, you know, I have uh, somewhat got a lot of that back and I've been in a very fortunate position um, to be able to bounce back because of what I do for a living um, lots of people are not in that position unfortunately when they lose their money then it's gone uh, there's not, not a way back for some people um, but you know as I said uh, you know the, the money side of things it's um it can be all relevant, Andrew, because if you're if you're a footballer on say you're on twenty thousand pounds a week for argument's sake, you don't want to win two hundred pounds because it doesn't make any difference to what your earnings are, what your incomings are, whatever. 
you want to win £50,000. And to win £50,000, you've got to put £10,000 on. Whereas if you're a builder or if you're a doctor and you're on £600, £700 a week, then you know you can bet £100, £200, and you know that you see that as being in a good position if you win. So the more you earn, the more you want to win, the more money you have to put on. You know, the less you earn, then you haven't got to put as much on. So it's all relevant to, to what where you are with your life um, and your thinking process, really. So that's where I was. So obviously my losses were a lot bigger than, than, than the normal average pundit who goes in the bookies every day and, and gambles £50 a day. But to him, he's only on £300 a week, so that £50 a day is very, very damaging to him and his end of the week end of the month payment so that's where um, that's the way that's the way you look at it even in the GA sense because you don't talk about losses and things like that because everybody's story everybody's limits everybody's lifestyle is, is totally different there's no there's no one person the same um, you're just in there to try and get help and, and, and to and to, and to learn and to learn about yourself and to learn about this horrible addiction. Um, and my wife came. My wife came with me for the first two or three years just for her to have an idea of what it takes as a wife to deal with a partner, to deal with living with somebody who's got an addiction. And um, she was just overwhelmed with the amount of information and uh, everything that she got to take from it. So the support network was there, luckily for me. Um, she didn't leave that day uh, with her bags. And I'm a very lucky boy because, uh, you know, that, that's where I am today. Yeah, um, fair play to her. Um, the ultimatum, but a, a strong woman as well to, you know, to go to these meetings and to, to get an insight into, into what, what you were dealing with. John, when you when you stood over the, the white line on a, on a Saturday or a midweek game with Celtic, you know, you... you you were in a team where, you know, you were worshipped like heroes by the fans. Did, you know, did playing those 90 minutes, you know, did that just take it away from the whole addiction, the whole, you know, was it, was it a, a release? I don't know if it was a release, Andrew, but, you know, it's amazing really that I had the career, you know, that, that I was able to have really, you know, breaking records and scoring goals and, Playing in huge games, huge mental games um, in terms of you know derbies and not talking just in Scotland here. I'm talking the North London derby. I'm, I'm, I'm talking West Ham, Spurs. I'm talking Wales, England. I'm talking representing my country over fifty times. It's <coughs> excuse me, at senior level, um, and it never really affected my on-field performances. Uh, maybe a couple of days. The sausage rolls comes into it <laughs> when I say about my performances because I was probably, you know, heavier. If I'd gone through my career, maybe a stone or two lighter, I might have gone on again, played at another higher level. Um, but I enjoyed my food and I made sure I was fit. Otherwise, you don't play for Martin O'Neill, you don't play for Gordon Strachan and Mark Hughes, Harry Redknapp. If you're not fit, then you don't play. So uh, I was fit. I was in a condition where I could play. Um, so in terms of the gambling and, and that mindset, it has over you. Um, no, no, I scored over 200 goals in my career in just over, just under 500 games. So um, when I look back at it, I think to myself, you know, I wasn't affected. I went out and I was professional in terms of my performances and my goals and, the way I was with my teammates and, um, you know, and what I had to do, what I had to do to master that art of being a centre forward and being able to score goals and be in the right place and make the right decisions at the right time. So, you know, I had a, I had a wonderful, wonderful career. A lot of, lot of players have swapped their careers for mine in terms of uh, what I achieved um, on a personal level. So, um, no. As I said, the answer to that would be no, because when I was playing, it, it didn't affect me. It didn't affect my performances at all, which is amazing, really. John, uh, 
thank you so much for taking time to join me on on the podcast and thanks very much for um I suppose being so honest about your gambling because we've had you on before and we have spoken about football and you know life and, and general stuff but just to get um the honesty of the gambling thing because at the moment now it's on the it's on the touch of it of it. you can put a bet on in a second on, on your phone now which was a bit different when when, when you were at, you know at the height of your your gambling so once again, John, thank you so much. And um, I'm looking forward to teaming up with you in November when we're in Dublin and Waterford together, um, as in Penna Browns in Dublin and the Rue Glen in Waterford as guests of the Port Lag Celtic Supporters Club. So uh, I'll see you in November. Yeah, brilliant, Andrew. And I'm looking forward to seeing you. Um, and also, obviously, with when they come and do these things, the podcasts and everything else, um, I hope people take something from it and uh, that's one of the reasons why I do it I'm not going ego I'm not doing this for my ego I'm doing it to speak to a good loyal friend like yourself and I hope it makes an impact I hope it impacts gamblers out there and if I can help one person John thanks very much and I'll talk to you soon John okay cheers and, Andrew and, and, thanks and mate I've never met Sarah but she sounds like an amazing woman so well done down that one I'm very lucky. I'm very lucky, mate. So, so she, but I'm lucky as well. <laughs> Magic, John. Talk to you soon. Take care, mate. Cheers, bye. Once again, folks, thanks for listening to the show. Thanks to John for joining me. If you're listening on Celtic Fancy and TV and you haven't hit that subscribe button, please click it so you'll never miss an episode. Thank you so much to John Mooney and the Rue Glen Hotel for the continued support and the sponsorship of the podcast. Our next live show, as I spoke about in the podcast, takes place in November and we'll be in Dublin and, and Waterford. John Hartson will be my special guest on Friday the 11th when we're in Pella Browns Bar in Dublin and tickets are available on Eventbrite or we're popping in to the bar. And on Saturday the 12th, we're in the Rue Glen Hotel, our sponsors of this podcast, as guests of Port Lag Emerald CSC. And joining myself and John Hartson will be another Celtic legend, Lisbon Lion John Fallon. And tickets for that one can be got from Pat or any of the committee. And you can find them on social media. That's the Port Lag Emerald CSC. Folks, we just have a few copies of More Than 90 Minutes, the print edition left. Issue 122. It's available on our online shop at celticfansin.com. And you'll also find subscription details, back issues, t-shirts, badges and scarves. And at celticfansin.com, you'll also find daily news and articles, all our audio Celtic Soul podcasts, all our video on Celtic Fansin TV, we deliver free content to all Celtic fans across all our platforms, written, visual and audio. If you'd like to support us, you can sponsor, subscribe, buy, become a member or donate for the price for a point. And thanks for all your support over the past 21 years. It's a busy schedule again this week for Andrew Postacoglu and the Celtic team and we will be there to cover the Celtic fans' journey. We are back in paradise on Saturday for 3pm kickoff off Hibs Hibbs before we head to Motherwell for our League Cup quarter-final at the unusual kickoff time of 6.15pm on Wednesday. We'll be back next week with another guest and another Celtic Soul podcast. You can also catch our Talk from the Terrace podcast on Celtic Fanzine TV, which is our match review and preview show. And you can also follow our Celtic Fan journey across social media and on CelticFanzine.com. Hail, hail, folks. Enjoy the weekend and we'll see us on the road watching Celtic and we'll also you can also hear us here next Friday 